morning. We're back again with our Gardening 101 series. This is part seven, Garden Pests. Uh, I'm Chris Coates. I'm a certified arborist, certified desert landscaper, and a master gardener. So today we're going to talk about some of the pests in your garden. Uh, those can be weeds, those can be the insects, which you usually think about, and there are some four-legged critters that we also consider as pests. Now, there are some good guys and some bad guys uh, that are insect pests, or insects, rather. Um, basically, we're going to look at removal and control of pests. And why don't we start with a definition of what a pest actually is? It's very hard to define pest basically something you don't want in your garden, uh, despite what someone else might say. We're going to look at uh, weeds, plants, and we're also going to look at um, insects and those four-legged critters. General rules of thumb, basically know your plant. Know what the pest is. Identify it as best you can. Uh, Sometimes you can only identify it to a general family uh, because we're not entomologists. Eradication of the pests is not the goal. Control of them is. Uh, you seldom ever really eradicate all the pests in your garden. But you go ahead and control the numbers and the damage that they do. Garden, weeds, uh, and pests. Uh, we'll start with the weeds. Dandelions, field bindweed, these kinds of things. Of course, there are a whole lot more weeds out there than what we're going to have time to talk about. But we'll kind of take the top, uh, the top nasties, the ones that, at least as a master gardener, I get the most questions on. Spurge. Spurge is a real scourge. <laughs> it's in the family Euphorbia. Uh, so it's actually related to poinsettias. Uh, there are lots of forms of spurge, lots of varieties, but they really all look pretty similar. And you can see uh, on the left of your screen here uh, the typical mat forming spurge uh, at the top picture, and the bottom picture is a spurge with a little bigger leaf, and sometimes they'll actually grow up a little bit. So there are lots of forms, but they all pretty much look uh, like both of these do. They're easy to kill, but very persistent because they have a long taproot into the ground. And they're very hardy. And they produce a ton of seeds, <laughs> like most weeds do. Now, if the ground is damp, they're very easy to pull out and get rid of. If you cannot pull them out, uh, go ahead and use an herbicide like Roundup or something like that. Uh, systemic herbicide is best because of that long taproot. You need to get all the way down there into the taproot. Uh, now the white sap on any plant in the Euphorbia family, even like your poinsettias, that sap can be irritating to some people. Uh, so uh, if it causes a skin irritation on you, uh, wash your hands well and use gloves. Uh, some people it doesn't bother at all, but it can cause problems. And as you're pulling this little guy out, these little spurge out, um, be very careful if you drop a little piece of it on the ground, it's going to grow. So definitely uh, when you're pulling it up, uh, have a basket or a bag with you so that you can put all those little pieces in that bag. Otherwise, you're just going to grow more spurge. Mullen. Mullen is kind of a neat thing. It's, um, to a lot of people, it's an herb. It's been a medicinal plant for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, it's in the snapdragon family, and it's what we call a biennial. In other words, it does its, um, its life cycle in two years. So the first year, you're going to have a nice, neat little rosette there. Uh, in the second year, it's going to uh, put up a flower stalk. And that flower stalk can be as high as eight foot. If you leave those seed pods uh, and let that seed spread, uh, there's a lot of seeds, as you can see from the, uh, the screen there. 
and those seeds can lay dormant in the soil for many years. Uh, so definitely, if you don't want it in your garden, uh, one thing you can do, other than digging it up, is let that rosette come up the second year, and as that seed uh, stalk is produced, cut the seed stalk off. It's a biennial. It's going to die that second year. So uh, you can do that uh, if you want, or you can just dig them out uh, of your garden and uh, put them in the mulch pile. Some people also refer to mullen as Indian toilet paper because they do have very large soft leaves. Uh, they're, they're really kind of a pretty plant, as long as it's not in the middle of your garden. Field bindweed is another good one. Um, we have, this one's in the morning glory family, and you probably recognize that by the neat little flowers it has. Uh, this guy has really deep roots. They can be as deep as 16 foot. Uh, which makes it very hard to remove. Uh, and also, uh, it will reproduce itself from underground stems called rhizomes. Uh, this is one of our most tenacious weeds in our landscape. About the only way you're going to get rid of this guy is with a systemic uh, herbicide like Roundup. Um, it is native to Europe, and yes, it's on the Arizona noxious weed list because it's, uh, it's very nasty, very hard to get rid of, and those seeds can be viable for 50 years. Another way to try to get rid of it if you don't want to use an herbicide, uh, try a very heavy mulch, much heavier than usual, like maybe about six inches of mulch, to try to smother it out. Now, it may indeed come up uh, through that mulch, but you can try to smother it out. Um, and also lasagna gardening, where you're putting the cardboard down and then various things on top. Uh, we talked about lasagna gardening in a previous uh, presentation. So yes, lasagna gardening can help to get rid of bindweed. Nasty, nasty plant. Pretty flower, though. OK, dandelions. Uh, how many people have not seen dandelions? Well, dandelions are edible. Uh, actually, all parts of the plant have been used medicinally. Um, and the flowers and leaves are edible. Many people actually buy seeds and grow dandelions uh, as part of their vegetables. It's, it's almost like an arugula. Uh, it's a little bit of a bitter uh, herb to put in your salad. This is another one with a taproot, and it could go down as far as 15 foot deep. So this taproot's pretty big, and yes, it will re-sprout if you leave just tiny pieces of the taproot in the soil. Um, again, you can try using a cover crop, maybe a clover of some type that gets very thick to smother out the plants and outcompete them, or again, a systemic uh, herbicide uh, like Roundup. Bermuda grass, oh boy, that's a hard one to get rid of. Uh, this is a sod-forming, warm season grass. It's perennial. Uh, and we like it because, of course, in our lawns, it's very drought tolerant. But those roots can go down six foot, so don't think you can just dig this baby up and get rid of it. Um, you can cut it off on top, but it'll come back. Besides producing seeds, it also reproduces with uh, above ground stems called stolons and underground stems called rhizomes. So uh, it, it can be very, very difficult to get rid of and uh, it will go dormant during droughts. So if you think, well, I can get rid of this just by not watering it for a year, guess what? It comes back the minute you start putting water on there. Uh, it is very hard to kill. And generally, about the only way to kill it is a systemic pesticide uh, that has something that has glyphosate, which is Roundup uh, in it. Insects, garden pest of insects. The first one, and there are many more than just these, but the first one, tomato hornworm. This is a biggie. He feeds on all types of tomato-related plants. That's the nightshade family or the solanaceae. 
The adult form of the tomato hornworm is one of those big moths. We call them sphinx moths or hawk moths. There are several species of them, but uh, they all look very similar. And you can see in the top left of your screen there a picture of uh, one of them. Uh, they're kind of pretty moths, and they're definitely huge. Uh, but uh, when you see those, you know that you're going to have tomato hornworms. Uh, these fellows drink uh, nectar. But of course, the larva, the hornworm, uh, he eats your plants. And he eats them very quickly. Uh, basically, the best way to remove them is get a pair of a needle nose pliers and pick them up and drop them into a little bottle of detergent or alcohol or something like that. Uh, I would use the needle nose pliers because that little horn you can see in the middle picture at the far left, he's got a little horn on his tail and he, it, it won't really hurt. Um, it won't hurt you as far as being poisonous or anything, but it hurts just to get stuck by that thing. So definitely use uh, something other than your fingers to pick them up with. Uh, one good way uh, to get rid of them also uh, for any caterpillar is to use something called BT Boy Tom uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a uh, very good biological uh, organic option. And it's basically a uh, bacteria that the, uh, it's sprayed on the plant, and the caterpillar eats it, and suddenly no longer eats. And so he dies, and that's that. It does not hurt birds or anything else. The only thing it hurts is caterpillars. So any type of caterpillar, definitely use uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. There are many products out there of different brand names that have Bacillus thuringiensis in them. And uh, do remember, if it rains or you spray the plant with the irrigation water, that will be washed off, so you'll need to respray. Uh, but it's, uh, it's excellent. Now, also, you can you see at the bottom left of your screen, that is the pupa uh, stage of the tomato hornworm. You may find these in the ground, because once the larva finishes feeding, he drops to the ground, uh, wiggles into the ground, and forms the pupa. If you find these in your garden, throw them out. <laughs> uh, get rid of them. You can also try doing things like uh, having some of the natural enemies uh, to prey on the larva form. Uh, and we'll discuss the natural enemies uh, in, an, in the next session. Uh, or you can even do crop rotation, meaning you don't plant tomatoes or any Solanaceae uh, member of the family in the same place. You move them from year to year. Japanese beetles, very. Um, very hard to get rid of. They generally are in small groups. At the bottom left of your screen, you can see a little group of them and the type of damage they do to your plants. Uh, they're, they're pretty, um, they, they'll basically eat most things, uh, but they have some special likes, you know, your beans, grapes, and raspberries, things like that. And of course, your roses. They uh, like to uh, be close to their damaged leaves. So you'll, if you look through the plant and you see that type of damage, you will undoubtedly find them somewhere nearby. Uh, and look under the plant on the ground, because sometimes they just drop down to the ground. Definitely consider row covers. Uh, this is just a, you have a hoop, and you put a very light, lighter than frost cloth. You can see through it very easily. Uh, and it's titled row covers if you go down to the nursery store to buy it. But it's just a very light cover. Keeps the insects off the plants. Of course, it also keeps the pollinators out. So you, you're going to have to open that up now and again. But it will deter the uh, Japanese beetles. Of course, you can hand pick them off, just like many things. Uh, hand pick them, knock them into a little jar of detergent, something like that. Neem oil 
N-E-E-M is very good. And they do have some traps, uh, pheromone traps for them. One problem with the traps is that sometimes they uh, attract more of these insects. So don't put the traps in your garden. Put them away from your garden uh, and your plants so that all these guys will go over there and not stop to have lunch on the way to the trap. Uh, there's some organic controls like milky spore, which is a fungal disease. And there are other types of things uh, that uh, you can have in your garden. But uh, they are definitely not the easiest guys to get rid of. You're, you're going to have to work a little bit on them. Thrips. You're probably going to have a hard time seeing these. They look like little teensy black threads. They're so tiny. And they basically insert their mouth parts into the leaf and suck the plant juices up. Uh, they're generally in large groups, and when you walk around and disturb the plant, they're going to be flying all over the place. The little, little hair threads flying all over. Uh, they do spread some diseases, and uh, basically the adults and the nymphs overwater, or excuse me, overwinter in the garden soil. And you can actually have up to 15 generations uh, per year in your garden. So that's why you get so many of these little guys. Um, basically, uh, you can reduce the places where the thrips breed by removing any green plant debris uh, on the ground. And I find it very useful. Strong spray of water gets rid of them. And we have a lot of beneficial insects that you can purchase and release in your garden. And uh, there are organic pesticides uh, like pyrethrins, uh, insecticidal soaps, and neem oil that will also work to uh, get rid of these little guys. Psyllids, um, these are another plant, uh, insect, plant uh, pest that inserts the mouth part and sucks out the plant juices. These guys also produce something called honeydew, which is a sticky substance. In essence, it's insect poop, but uh, it's a sticky substance. And the sticky substance itself isn't so bad, but upon the, the sticky substance, this honeydew, there's a mold, a black sooty mold that grows. And this, of course, if it's thick enough, can interfere with the plant's photosynthesis. Um, and it, it's just messy is what it is, really, especially if, uh, if you've ever had your car parked under a tree and all of a sudden there's a lot of sticky stuff on it. Very often, uh, it can be plant sap, but very often it is also the, the uh, honeydew from the uh, psyllids. And uh, don't, conf uh, don't uh, get the adult cycad confused. The cycads are not a problem. Just ignore them. But the, uh, and you can see on the left of your screen, there's um, a, an adult cycad on the top of the top picture and a uh, adult psyllid on the bottom of that picture. So you can see the difference in them. Yes, some psyllids do um, vector diseases, uh, but uh, in the most serious one is the citrus psyllid. We don't have him up here. He's down in the valley. But uh, it, he does vector a very um, serious and incurable disease of citrus trees. Um, lots of enemies bugs, ladybugs, lacewings, things like that. Uh, and if you're going to use an uh, insecticide, make it a contact insecticide for these little guys. Uh, this will, you, you need to be very careful about your bees. You don't want to kill the bees in your garden. And uh, most of the contact insecticides will do that. Neem oil and insecticidal soaps is also good. Everybody knows aphids. Uh, these little guys, again, suck plant sap. Uh, and they're generally in large groups, so they're hard to miss. 
Uh, they also produce honeydew uh, with the same problems uh, with the black sooty mold. You will often find ants that uh, herd the aphids. They will pick them up and move them around because the ants collect the honeydew uh, and feed off of it and the black sooty mold that grows on it. Uh, again, uh, you can go out there and just crush them by hand, run your hand up the leaves and go ooey gooey, uh, but that does work. Uh, if you're going to have, if there are a large number of them, hard spray of water. It's the easiest, cheapest thing to do. The little guys will fall to the ground and become lunch or dinner to a bird or some other insect. Uh, easiest way to control them is just a hard spray of water. White flies, again, you've probably seen these guys. You go out to the garden, and all of a sudden, all these little white things are flying around. These feed on the underside of plant leaves, and uh, yes, they're, they are suckers of plant juice also. And uh, both the nymphs and the adults feed that way. They can carry and transmit some viral diseases, uh, but basically, uh, you're going to have to look at some, uh, some predators like your ladybugs and your lace wings and things like that. Insecticidal soap and horticultural oils will work to kill them. I have found that uh, it's very easy to get rid of them with, again, a hard spray of water. These guys tend to like dryness, so if you make the environment a little more moist by giving them a hard spray of water, knocking them off the plants, and the plants have a little more water, they tend to go somewhere else. The water doesn't kill them, but it discourages them. Uh, maybe they'll go over to your neighbors. Stink bugs, we've seen these guys, that you squish them and, <coughs> boy, ha ha ha. Uh, so, uh, these guys also suck plant juices, both the adult and the nymph. And basically, you'll see a little pin prick in the leaf with kind of a yellow circle around it, and that's how you tell their damage. You can see a couple on the left of your screen there. They come in a couple different colors. Uh, again, the usual um, beneficials, uh, ladybugs and minute pirate bugs and uh, things like that will help deter them. Uh, you can plant what they consider trap plants uh, off to one side of your garden, which will encourage the little insects to go to those trap plants. Uh, and then definitely you can treat them there. There are traps that you can use uh, with some success and some not success, but uh, definitely you can buy the pheromone traps. Uh, and sometimes you'll see their waxy coating, which is kind of like a, uh, we call it lerps. Uh, it's kind of a waxy thing. It might be a flat coating or it might kind of hang down a little bit. Uh, and neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and pyrethine are probably the uh, organic sprays that you might want to try. Everybody's seen plant bugs. Actually, there are three things that kind of look like plant bugs. Uh, box elder bugs, which generally are found around box elders, uh, but they'll sometimes go around apple trees and plum trees. Uh, bordered plant bugs, uh, these feed on the juices, again, uh, of your plants. You probably want to step on them. There's a couple in the top uh, or in the middle left of your screen there that are making more little plant bugs and milkweed bugs, uh, which are really more of a nuisance than a threat. Uh, they're generally around milkweeds. But uh, these three types of bugs are, are probably in your garden somewhere. I see them around a lot. Squash bugs, um, yes, they're nasty. Uh, and they actually, as they, they again are sucking juice uh, from the plant, but as they suck that juice, they also inject a toxin that turns the leaves black and causes the leaves to die. 
Uh, they, the adults will overwinter in the garden under debris and other things. Um, they're most active when they come out in May and June. Uh, definitely, again, the floating row covers will help for young plants. Generally, the mature plant can suffer some damage from the squash bug, uh, but the young ones you've got to protect against uh, the squash bugs. You can use diatomaceous earth to sprinkle around the plants. Uh, that might help. Or you can use neem oil uh, to smother them and get rid of them. But uh, they're fairly common also. Flea beetles are little itsy bitsy guys and they jump <laughs> just like fleas do. Uh, they chew uh, and you can see on the upper left of your screen, you can see some of the damage. Uh, it's kind of like shot holes, uh, like buckshot. And uh, even the larval stages, they feed on the roots. Uh, and basically, they'll eat most anything out there that they, uh, they can find. Uh, again, your row covers will help. But basically, uh, thick mulches might help because they would uh, interrupt the breeding cycle with the uh, larvae. You can see the larvae at the bottom left of your screen. And they do have some predators that go after them. Parasitoids are insects that parasitize other insects. And there are some disease pathogens that you can use. So that's about the end of part seven. Uh, we're going to go on with part eight and talk about some of those garden friends and look a little bit uh, more deeply into extending your garden season. And thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, we'll be back.